Welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. This is a unique podcast that uh, comes your way every week, uh, unless we're on vacation or something like that. Uh, and you can go grab this uh, wherever you get podcasts. Now, if you only know us by the podcast, uh, we, we host the Rick and Bubba show, which is a weekly five days a week show that uh, that runs for five hours if you count the kickoff hour, and uh, Bubba and I are on it for four hours. If you want to find out information about that, uh, simply go to Rick and Bubba, spell out the word and dot com. Bubba, today, one of our favorite topics, my friend. We are going to get to talk about food, and we're glad to have world-renowned chef Chris Hastings with us. Chris, how are you Chris, doing, sir? what about it, buddy? Morning, guys. Good to be on your, on the podcast. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking uh, about my favorite subject, uh, food, with y'all. Well, we happen to be connoisseurs of the first order. Well, let me tell you something. If you were, a, like you are with food, like a brilliant <laughs> musician, you know, there's nothing that a brilliant musician loves more than for someone who sits around who loves music. Well, you, sir, the brilliant chef that you and your wife and, and your son and all these great chefs that you've trained, uh, we are fans, so uh, you're, you're going to be you're going to be singing to the choir today, my friend. Uh, yeah, you guys have been great supporters of ours since we opened in 1995, when y'all were young and getting everything rocking and rolling back in the day. So yeah. uh, uh, we've known each other a long time, and I appreciate y'all's friendship and your support all these years. Well, you, you hit on it. I didn't think I looked at the started thinking about the years. Uh, Chris starts in Birmingham with his, you know the infant stage of his great restaurants exactly when the Rick and Bubba show. Started. Oh, I know, I know. And, and we've all kind of grown together. Uh, Chris, I, I've got to ask you this. And, and then we want to get into the history because a lot of people, when they hear your name, they know you're a world renowned chef, but they may not have known how, how that all came about, but right out of the gate, how do you not weigh 400 pounds? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, good genetics. <laughs> I mean, I, I got skinny people. I mean, my people, my people don't break 180 pounds ever. I got you know, a leg that's 180 grown, pounds. Grown men, grown men do not get over 180 pounds in my family, no matter how little or how much they eat. They're just, we're mm. skinny people. And it's just, you know, my engine runs real high all the time. Well, Bubba mentioned it, so let, let's let's go back because you know I, I've heard parts of this great story, and, and I will just tell you this: that uh, you have been a, a great friend. Uh, there have been times that I tried not to abuse that uh, uh, the the ability to reach you, but tried is the key. Yeah, because I've tried, and and Chris will say, but you know, when my wife and I have a special occasion, I'm talking about nine out of ten times, or we have friends that are visiting. You know, because we come from a, a city, Birmingham, Alabama, that is known for tremendous food, and Chris Hastings is right in the middle of that. We always want to go to uh, one of Chris's restaurants. Our favorite is Hot and Hot Fish Club. Now, uh, we we love Oven Bird and, and and other creations you put together, but Hot and Hot is where Sherry and I have spent so many special dates and anniversaries and big moments and kids going off to college and parents, you know, visiting and friends coming. We've taken missionaries there from all over the world. <laughs> uh, so it, it, and sometimes you have to call and say, Hey, Chris, I'm trying to get a table and I can't get one. And, uh, you have been so good to us, but, but go back, uh, and how this all starts. You, you really are not originally from the state of Alabama. How take Bubba and I, and, and the people listening on the journey of Chris Hastings deciding he wanted to be a chef. So I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. I mm -hmm. uh, was in high school, like most uh, kids, looking for, you know, gas money and beer money. So I had a part-time job in a restaurant. I was busting tables, washing dishes, occasionally being a prep cook. Um, and um, I had been there for my junior year in high school through my senior year in high school. And um, uh, my senior year, um, my, my mother got cancer and, and, and died. And so mm -hmm. the, I had been accepted to Appalachian state to go there for, you know, typical four year college degree. Um, but the chef in the kitchen or in the restaurant pulled me aside and he said, Hey, you know, you've done a pretty good job for us here. Um, you know, just doing part-time work in the kitchen. Would you be interested in, um, you know, kind of coming full-time into the kitchen because I heard you were going to take a gap year uh, since your mother died. And would you like to spend that gap year in the kitchen with me? 
and just pull up a cutting board next to me and you and I'll cook and learn and I'll teach you every day. I said, absolutely. I would love that. That would be um, exactly what I think I need from a, just a, you know, working out life kind of moment as well as, you know, learning and, you know, you know, getting my mind away from the tragic tragedy of my mother's death into, you know, learning and, and, and being involved with this kind person who, um, you know, was willing to help me in my time of need. And then you know, it's kind of a God thing, you know? So then at the end of that year, um, he said, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to App State or you going to, you want to go to culinary school? I said, well, you know, I really would like to go to culinary school. So he said, look, I, I'll write a, a, a letter kind of vouching for you to Johnson and Wales, which is a culinary school in Providence, Rhode Island, where he had attended. And you just go ahead and apply immediately. So I did. And I, you know, like I said, I said, you know, I made a decision. I want to go to culinary school. I hopped a train in Charlotte, North Carolina. I got off in Providence, Rhode Island, and I went to two years of culinary school in Providence. And I've been a journeyman chef, you know, from, let's see, that was 1981 until 1995. I've traveled the country um, working as a, like I said, a journeyman chef. Um, in different places from the Northeast to uh, the West Coast to all over the South and um, finally decided it was time for me to um, think about opening my own restaurant somewhere in the South. Uh, at that point, you know, we had two boys. We, we wanted to raise our kids and start a business and, and, and build, you know, a future somewhere in the South. And we had looked at Charleston. We'd looked at Charlotte, we'd looked at Atlanta, we'd looked at New Orleans, we'd looked at Chattanooga, we looked at uh, Nashville, we looked all over. And uh, I had previously worked with uh, Frank Stitt um, at that point, and I called Frank from San Francisco, where we were living at the time, and said, look, I'd like to move back to, to Birmingham, and um, if, you, if you could use, you know, a chef for a few years, I'm looking to open my own restaurant, you know, sometime after that three-year you know, period with you because I'm doing the research to open. And he said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. I could use your help. And, and then, you know, we tried to figure out other cities in that three-year period. And I just couldn't find a city that made as much sense for my family and I because we had developed a kind of a, you know, people had become, you know, familiar with my work and, you know, my family and all that. And they said, well, look, why are you going to Atlanta or Nashville or Charlotte or New Orleans or Charleston? you should stay here and open a restaurant. And, you know, the more I've kind of fought that idea, the more my wife's voice came, <laughs> you know, to bear saying, look, let's not work harder. Let's work smarter. We, people love the work you do. We have professional relationships here, whether those are, you know, banking attorneys, accountants at access to, you know, investment dollars, you know, people would love to see a, another restaurant in Birmingham um, you know, and, and one thing led to another and, you know, in a million years, would I've ever expected that I would wind up in Birmingham, Alabama, making my bones as a young, you know, restaurateur and business owner, and then having accomplished all that we've accomplished over the last, gosh, 27, 28 years now, since 1995, we opened, but I mean, I was a cook in 1980 really so that's 41 years I've been cooking that's a long time and so just in, in my lifetime I'll tell you a funny story too um I was working at uh uh Rich Carlton in Buckhead when I was dating a girl who actually was from Dothan but she was she is was living in Atlanta at the time and she had worked for Frank um as a hostess the previous summer and she said look I've, I've got uh, friends in, in Birmingham would you like to go to Birmingham and meet them, and we'll eat a great meal at this fantastic restaurant called Highlands Bar and Grill. I said, sure, I've never been to, Bur I've never been to you know, Alabama, much less Birmingham. And so I get to meet Frank and Francis, and they say, hey, are you looking for a job? And I, I said, you know, I said, well, I'm always looking for an opportunity. He said, well, we're looking for a sous chef. We need some help. And so Frank and I got to talking, and it came down to the time where, hey, we'd like to offer you a job. You need to make a decision. I'd come to a, a lunch meeting with them prepared to say, you know, thank you very much, Frank. Thank you very much, Francis. I really appreciate the opportunity, but I think I'm going to stay in, in Atlanta working for the Ritz-Carlton and Buckhead. Well, I get to that meeting. We have a delightful lunch. 
We talk about all things that are important and fun. Of course, that's food and what we do. <laughs> and um, then Frank says, okay, well, here's what we'd like to pay you. Um, what is your decision? And I'm just telling you, this is how, this is how crazy life is. I was prepared to, at that very moment, say, no, thank you very much. <laughs> but somebody put their hand on, their, on my shoulder and they moved me over here and yes came out of my mouth. <laughs> and that changed the entire trajectory of my life, my career, my family, my, my future. It's, it is to this day inextricable unless, unless you really take stock in what happened there. And the truth of the matter is, is the man put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, don't say no. You're going to say yes today. <laughs> don't, blow, said, yeah. don't blow this. <laughs> so when you said yes, you, you couldn't even believe you heard yourself say yes? That is exactly right. I said, what just happened to me? Yes, came out of my mouth. <laughs> what have I done? What have I done? Did you, I'm leaving Atlanta. I'm leaving the Ritz-Carlton. I'm in a leadership position inside the, you know, their culinary structure. And I'm just walked away from that to go to Birmingham, Alabama and work for Frank Stitt. Chris, it, it, let me, when we come back, I want to ask you this question. You can you kind of be thinking about it. It, is that common where you would go to work with with somebody and them know that you were going to open a restaurant, a com, you know, a possible competitor to them? Is that well, common in your business? Well, at that time, I didn't know that I was going to be you a competitor going- to Frank. I was just a young kid looking for work. The idea of opening up a restaurant happened, that was in 1986, okay, when I accepted the job with Frank. I didn't really know I was wanting to own, think about opening a restaurant yeah. till 1991. I got serious about thinking about opening a restaurant. So that meeting had nothing to do with me thinking I'd ever, in the history of ever, <laughs> open and own a restaurant and live the rest of my life in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, will I tell you, was that the best decision I've ever made in my life other than marrying my wife? That was the second best decision I've ever made in my life. <laughs> All right, we'll come back. We'll continue. Chris Hastings, uh, world-renowned and, and has just received all types of awards as a chef. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to talk more about his great story. Uh, and we're going to get in talking about, too, just one of our favorite topics, and that's delicious food. Mm-hmm. When we continue on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right, so Bubba, we, we've been talking about on, on the big show and here on the podcast about uh, these Raycon earbuds. I mean, you know, you and I have been honored to, to talk about a lot of products. But do you not agree this is one of the most popular ones that we've ever presented to the audience? Yeah, we get a lot of feedback on these, and people love the quality, and it appears to be much cheaper than anybody else's price. But the quality is yeah. not sacrificed. Yeah, because I know when the earbuds came out, everybody's like, well, these must be the only ones. And sometimes, let's admit, they looked a little awkward. Uh, they, they, they were they were they comfortable? And then when, when Raycon came into this arena, the, the first thought was, well, yeah, you've got it about half the price. But are they as good? And the answer is yes. And then, of course, today we're going to get you an additional 15% off your Raycon order. If you go to buyraycon.com slash Rick Bubba pod. Okay. That that's, you need to use that for an additional 15% off Rick Bubba pod. And, and let me tell you something, no matter what you're listening to, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, if you were listening on, on these, uh, by Raycon earbuds, the E25s, it would sound fantastic. You're going to love the battery life. You're definitely going to love the comfort and how discreetly they fit uh, in your ears. And, um, uh, and, and the way that they look. So they've got a 45-day happiness to, uh, you know, guarantee. You have to love them inside 45 days. If you don't, then they'll refund you. So you really can't uh, lose. Give these a try right now. Uh, get your own soundtrack. Put them on Raycon. Go to buyraycon.com slash rickbubbapod for an additional 15% off. That's buyraycon.com slash rickbubbapod. All right, so we're spending time with Chris Hastings on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. So, Chris, uh, we, we were talking about your meeting with Frank Stitt. Now, Frank, of course, has gone on to receive, uh, even recently, these uh, monumental awards as a chef, as have you. But when you're talking to him in 1986 uh, about this, when you're going to say no, and then we believe supernaturally you were told to say yes, at that time, did, did Frank have those kind of accolades? Did he have... Did you know what you were getting into at that time? Like, was he already receiving the accolades, or was he himself not yet to the point that that he is now? 
It's a great question because Frank opened up in 82 and just about the time I showed up there, there had been a, a few big, big riders who had come through the Highlands Bar and Grill within the, about a year of my arrival prior to my arrival. And so when I got there, um, I did, I was not aware of any of that. I just went to work. Okay. <laughs> and then, then all of a sudden, you know, you have big time people like John Mariani, who was one of the greatest food writers in the history of the country for many, many years. And, you know, John T. Edge with the Southern Foodways Alliance. And, you know, the list goes on and on. I can, I can name so many people that, you know, fell in line to, you know, discovering, you know, the great experience that was, uh, Highlands Bar and Grill and all of the amazing food and hospitality that, you know, Frank and Francis represented, um, you know, during the period of time I was there. And, um, you know, it was a magical time. I'll, 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 I'll be honest with you. It was something I'd never seen or experienced before when, you know, so much acclaim is coming, you know, to the, to Frank and the work he's done and our kitchen. And, and it was just really cool to see, you know, major publications like Southern living and the New York times and, you know, on and on, you know, month in and month out, you know, here, here's the Highlands bar and grill and the, the nation's biggest publications. And, you know, it's a great sense of pride to be associated with such a great team. And I'll always be grateful for Frank for giving me the opportunity to work with him and, you know, his, his team, you know, I did a two year stint. I did an 86 to 90, let's say 86 to eight, late 88 and then 91 to 94 um, uh, where I worked, you know, two, three year stints with Frank and, and uh, it was, you know, both were amazing and I was grateful and, um, you know, he is the godfather of Southern cuisine. There's no question about that. So now That's to Bubba's the, question. Yeah, so now the question Bubba was asking. So there was a time when when Frank Stitt has 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 helped uh, been there. You've you've trained under him. You've learned under him. You're part of the success. And you decide you're going to do your own thing. So, so now we and that's are. That's a big jump, I yeah. guess, because you're talking about business now, not yeah. just cooking. What was that experience like? Uh, to make a decision to be an owner. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you're you know now you're going to Bubba's original question. You're going to be in the same city where Frank is operating. And now I know there's enough food and restaurants for people to always have somewhere to eat. But in the business world, you're about to be a competitor. How does that go in the food business? How does business? that go in the food business when you're when you're leaving your your mentor and saying, now I'm going to do my own thing in the same city? Well, you know, it's it's um, you know, I'm sure that, you know, at the time, you know, Frank probably would say, well, you know, I really kind of would appreciate it if you, <laughs> you know, would go to Atlanta or right. Nashville or Charleston or Charlotte or wherever. But really, at the end of the day, um, I, you know, I didn't really need or um, ask Frank for permission to open up a restaurant in, in Birmingham. I had to make a decision for my family. Right. Um, and, um, you know, my hope was, of course, that he would say, you know, good luck. Um, you know, you'll be competing against the best, which, of course, is Frank. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we've we've had a great working relationship, but this is business now. And, you know, we'll, we'll be competitors. We never had that discussion, but, um, you know, it was a decision that I thought was absolutely the best decision based on all of the work I'd done leading up to that decision to figure out what would be the best decision to stay in Birmingham. And, uh, I really wasn't, um, I, it didn't give me any heartburn or, or nervousness about whether or not I could compete or would survive or wouldn't survive as a, as a small business owner in a new restaurant in Birmingham, not, not because I was necessarily competing directly against Frank or any other restaurant for that matter. I, I knew that I had the ability to cook and there was a need in Birmingham at that time yeah. for, you know, more. And so I knew that if I could open a restaurant, do honest, well-prepared food that was unique to me and my approach to cooking, which was wildly different than what Frank does, that it would just be another great restaurant in the Birmingham area. And that's exactly what happened. It, 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 it just never was, a, um, you know, any concern for my wife or I or, 
as far as I know, Frank, that the, yeah. the, that would be an issue. And it turned out to be best for both of us because it built on what Frank, the kind of the foundation, which, which Frank started and he is the bedrock. He is the, you know, the, the cornerstone of the culinary kind of universe that has become the Birmingham scene. I mean, think about the generations of cooks that have come through Frank's restaurants, oh, yeah. my restaurants, and then all of the cooks that have come out of those two restaurants that are now restaurant tours, not, in, not only in Birmingham, but around the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a huge family tree. If we were to ever build out that family tree, it would be amazing to see all of the people who have come through those restaurants and have impacted the American culinary scene. It is wildly cool, the entire story. Oh, it's one of the things we're most proud of uh, being from Birmingham is the delicious food that continues to be created but has been created and will and, and will go on to be created for generations to come. So when you open up the restaurant, w- what was the first restaurant that you opened? It, w- was, it, was it Hot and Hot? Was that the first one? Yes, Hot and Hot Fish Club, 1995. Uh, it was November of 1995. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've been open every, you know, oh, yeah. ever since no, I, no breaks other than COVID. So what, 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 where in the world did this name come from? I remember the first time when we all moved to Birmingham, Bubba, mm-hmm. like I say, you started this restaurant uh, a year after the show had started. And then we got here in 98, was it Bubba? 98 that we got to Birmingham uh, and uh, actually housed have in to Birmingham. look it up, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we were coming here even, you know, coming over for dinner because we come to Birmingham to eat anyway. Yeah. But I remember the first time that I had a friend say Hot and Hot Fish Club. And I said, what, what did you say? And, and they said Hot and Hot Fish Club. And, and in my mind, I didn't know what to do with it. I mean, where did this name come from? So it's an interesting story. So all of my uh, family history on my mother's side um, came out of the low country, specifically Polly's Island, South Carolina. So Benjamin Hugh Frazier came from Edinburgh, Scotland in 1790. He became a rice planter around Polly's Island. And from, you know, the 1790s up until, you know, 1860, they had uh, rice production there at Rose, Rosemount, uh, um, was the name of uh, the rice plantation. And um, I, my, my grandmother was a big, you know, this is your family. You need to know where your family came from. She, she marked up all of our, all this, there's this book called uh, the rice planters of um, uh, um, Waccamaw County. And that's the county where um, uh, a lot of the rice plantations were. Uh, and so all of my family history was there from 1790 up until, you know, my grandmother and she marked everybody's name. And so what I learned is I started reading that book and back in those days, men's clubs were very prevalent. It didn't matter if it was a, a gaming club, a military club, uh, a fishing club, a hunting club, whatever men gathered in their groups. Um, this particular group of, of men, um, um, gathered because they were huge foodies, just like you guys, they wanted to kind of get away for um, uh, e- each once a month from May until October, um, they would, they would, or excuse me, October until May, they would gather um, in uh, once a month at, at a clubhouse where they would have these epic meals. And they wrote in their journals and their diaries about the value and the importance of gathering together, you know, going through the front door of the clubhouse, closing that door behind them, leaving all of the worries and the trouble of the day on the other side of that door while they celebrated life with their dearest friends and they broke bread together and they ate. Now they were, wrote wildly about their the value and the importance of that in all of their diaries. The, the, theme, the theme was that I kept reading about was everybody wrote about the value and the importance of having a place where you could cross a threshold shut the door behind you, leave trouble behind for a period of time, break bread and celebrate life with, 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 to the exclusion of all else for that brief period of time. And, and, and so to me, that was, that was very resonant. That made a lot of sense to me. So I said, all right, so if I could, res- if I could resurrect the, the philosophy and the spirit of that idea where my wife and I created a restaurant where anybody could cross that threshold you know, to have dinner with us for some period of time, whether it's an hour or four hours, they can leave all their troubles on the other side of the door. They can be with the people they love. They can break bread, eat delicious food and commune 
over, you know, happiness and joy, not trouble and worry. That was the foundation of the restaurant. And we weren't afraid of using the original name, Hot and Hot Fish Club. Now, our investors said to us, like, whoa, 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 Hot <laughs> and Hot Fish Club? Like, that's ridiculous. You can't, that, that, that won't work. Nobody's going to remember. And I said, look, guys, don't worry. They said, well, why don't you call it Hastings Bistro? So I'm like, no, it's going to be the Hot and Hot Fish Club. Sorry, you can take your check back. That's the deal. Here's how it's going to work. It's going to be truncated. Nobody's going to call it Hot and Hot Fish Club forever. It's just going to be known as Hot and Hot. And that's it. It's just so don't sweat it, guys. If you still want your check back, I'll give it to you. But your, your money's good. Trust me. And nobody gave me the nobody said I want my check back. And that's exactly what happened. People came. They crossed the threshold. They communed together. They they talked about things that matter and broke bread and ate delicious food. And, and it just grew one meal at a time one gathering at a time, one day, one week, one month, one year. And then it just became the hot and hot fish club and what it all, you know, has come to be one meal at a time, one hope of crossing the door, the threshold, closing that door, people getting together and celebrating life in a way that, that would to the exclusion of worry and trouble. Well, and we're going to come back and keep talking about that. Bubba, you and I were just sitting here murmuring, Amen. Uh, and when you jump into delicious food, you leave all your worries behind. We'll come back. We'll talk more with Chris Hastings when this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, continues. Now, Bubba, another thing we need, uh, and I'm already getting hungry because we're going to start talking about the specific food here in a minute, is another thing you got to have, though, you got to have comfortable underwear. I mean, we want a delicious meal, but you could have a great meal, but if you don't have great underwear, then really there's still something that's trying to take your mind away from immersing yourself in a great meal. Rick, when you talk about being comfort, uh, comfortable, it starts with your underwear. It does. I mean, if, if your underwear is not right, nothing Nothing's else is right. going to be in play. You know? So let's point you to Tommy John. Tommy John, uh, the newest and most advanced men's underwear yet with a performance-grade dry-release fabric blend that is exclusive to Tommy John's. And, boy, it, Tommy John's is good year-round. But but let me if you're listening to this podcast or you're watching it and, and it's still summertime, especially where we all live. We have great food, but we got humidity. And, and, and breathable underwear, it's the latest comfort and innovation, and, and you can't get this with anywhere anybody else, no other brand. Uh, and and I, we wear them. We love them. It keeps you cool. It keeps you comfortable. keeps you dry. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they, and the, the Apollo underwear, which they have now, they're soft. They're supportive. Uh, it stretches for the perfect fit every day. Hey, look, and they got them. Look, you know our guys, Bubba. They got it all the way up to 4X. Thank goodness. Okay. And and with over 15 million pairs sold, men across America are loving Tommy John underwear because there's there's no more of, of the, the chafing, the, hey, my underwear's sticking to me, none of that. And, and, and look, we need that. So why don't you move right now to get the new Apollo men's underwear. Uh, it, it, it's high-end underwear to keep, uh, well, let's just call it, it it's high-end for the rear end. Okay, so, so right now we're going to get you 20% off your first order at tommyjohn.com slash rickbubba. Just put our names together. Go to tommyjohn.com slash rickbubba for 20% off tommyjohn.com slash rickbubba. Back with Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Chris Hastings, world-renowned chef, is our guest. Uh, he, he, we, we got up to the point that now his first restaurant is open in Birmingham, Alabama, all under the premise of come inside these doors, mm-hmm. leave your worries behind, Sit down. Let's talk. Let's converse over delicious food. Chris, I, I've got to know because I'm not much of a cook, and that 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 lends itself to a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. But we see shows like Hell's Kitchen and all that. Is it really that rough back there? <laughs> well, you know, so Hell's Kitchen was a lot of fun. By the way, Gordon Ramsay's a great guy, friend of mine. He, uh, he called me one day and said, hey, let's you mind doing being the, the guest chef for the Southern episode? I said, absolutely. I'll come out to L.A. Yeah. I'll do the show with you. He, he, is, he is a wonderful guy and really, of course, great to me. But, you know, he does have a persona where he's, he's had to kind of jack you up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> if, you're, if you're, you know, these, two, these young people competing <laughs> against one another. And, you know, it's, it makes for great television. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was funny when I did that show, um, you know, he he was getting on guys left and right. And I was getting on guys left and right. And one of the guys that I teed up and said, you know, you know, what are you doing, man? That's just that your technique's terrible. Your flavor's not, you know, 
you're not you're not getting it done. You're, you're letting your team down. So I kind of teed that guy up, you know, on TV. And um, and at the end of it, he got you know he he kind of was you know his team lost. He was like, I don't even know who that guy thinks he is. He doesn't even have a southern accent. I don't even think he's from the south. <laughs> like, but, yeah, whatever. You're out. So it was a great show and a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, Gordon's a great guy. Um, um, uh, and so, but you know, we've done a bunch of that stuff, but so it doesn't I, get I that really, intense. You don't get I that intense. It. I, you know, when you go to hot and hot fish club, for those who've never are been there. Are you screaming at people in the back like that? That's what we yeah, want I've never seen it because <laughs> at, at, at hot and hot, especially the first location, you know, where you were for many, many years, he's, he's just recently gone to a little more square footage and it's a beautiful location too, but you could sit and we used to come in a lot and, and, and they had, you could request you sit there and you can see the kitchen working right in front of you. Which you won't talk about being hungry. Oh, I know. You can start wanting other people's food and all that. But I never saw. I mean, that, those teams seem to work like a fine old machine. But I, I'm assuming that takes time. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody has a role. But but I, I'm assuming in the hiring process, boy, it's important you make the right decisions to get that kind of uh, smooth running operation. Well, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I consider myself uh, an educator and a teacher as much as I do a chef because. To perform at that high level, as you, as for those of you who've not been in our restaurant, uh, the Hot Night Fish Club, it's in a, an exposed kitchen. There's, you sit at the chef's counter, you've got 12 seats, and our entire mm-hmm. kitchen and our our, our 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 working environment is exposed. So there, you you can watch us, and we call it dinner and a show. So mm-hmm. you can sit at the chef's counter and you can watch every single thing prepared. So imagine you know, having people look over your shoulder within six feet of you, watching every single move you make. It's got to be clean. It's got to be organized. It's got to be quiet. It's got to be efficient. It's got to be delicious. And it's got to be on time. And it's got to be done efficiently. And so it took us a while in the very beginning when we opened to really um, fine tune that dance, if you will, that that the show part. Um, it, it just, it required a lot of discipline and a lot of working on how we presented our brand and our, and our look and our, um, you know, the show piece of it. Um, people who didn't necessarily weren't sitting at the chef's counter didn't, they were eating the delicious food and they loved it. But those who sat, sat at the chef's counter got to kind of look behind the veil and see what it took every day to execute, you know, 100 to 200 covers a day. Um, and how, did, how on earth does that work? And how does it look? And how does it, you know, it's a lot of energy and it's a lot of, so it's it's a neat place to sit and watch food being prepared. So let's let's you want to take some. Let's get into some pointers with you, okay? You you obviously create your mind can't help but think of things. And if you've never dealt with the food where we live down south, uh, southern food is delicious. And 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 you of course took the the southern you know cuisine and and you. I don't want anybody to think it's not frou-frou. It really isn't. It, it's just these creative recipes. And I, I personally, you know, I know you changed the menu up, uh, you know, uh, throughout different times. Anytime I see quail on the menu, I always order it. Uh, because uh, Chris hunts. I mean, he's, he's a hunter just like us. And he he, he has a real, real uh, obsession with turkey hunting. But uh, So he, he hunts a lot. But the quail and stuff like that, how does your mind work? Do you shoot all the quail? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> do you bag every one of them? But, but I mean, like when you start thinking about, okay, we all have had quail before, but you know, in your mind, you're thinking about all these fish dishes, all this rabbit and quail, mm. and and you know, the the, the beef tenderloin and, and a steak. How does your mind work? Because I, I just from being around you, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it. You say, I tell you what, just put some salt and pepper on it and put a potato beside it. You're you're looking to bring out these incredible flavors, but but not every flavor goes together. How, how does that process work? Experimenting a lot? What do you do? All right. So that's a, it's a fantastic question. Thank you both for thinking that through because it, it really is important. So let's first talk about the outdoors in my time as a child. I grew up in the outdoors hunting and fishing, and I live seasonally because, you know, you, you fished a certain period of time. You yep. hunted a certain period of time. You, you camped and you did all kinds of different things and cooked over open fires and all that. My life lived as a young person seasonally around hunting and fishing. So as I became a chef, I I also began to realize that the the, the products that I source, whether it was tomatoes, corn, field peas, okra, or uh, persimmons and pumpkins and root vegetables or certain types of fish 
um, that were all seasonally available. I lived my life just like an outdoorsman in my kitchen. I lived seasonally. I accessed food seasonally. I only found the very best, whether it was soft shell crabs in the, in the springtime or triple tail or, um, you know, uh, when, you know, uh, popping over running up and down the, the shore of, uh, you know, the Gulf Coast or Kobe are running in the spring. I'm thinking about those things. Or if I move into the summertime, I'm thinking tomatoes and corn and okra and field peas and, you know, all the things that are available through all, through all of our, you know, the, the, all around the southeast and particularly the great state of Alabama is an agri, you know, it's an agrarian, you know, you know, state where people grow things. And so we have access to amazing, you know, tomatoes, corn, peaches, you know, it goes on and on and on. And so if I do my job, I, I live seasonally, I think seasonally, I search out the very best, uh, you know, you know, peach farmer, the very best tomato farmers, the very best pea farmers, the best, you know, uh, uh, people who are, you know, uh, uh, you know raising oysters or fishing. The and I just, then, yeah. then I get those ingredients together and I'll use the hot nut tomato salad as an example. That's kind of the iconic dish. So oh that dish was born out of my childhood. My mother was a great cook. My aunts were great cooks. You know, everybody's great cooks. Um, and so I grew, grew up around, you know, homemade food. We had a big garden and, you know, every day and all that. Succotash this time of year was what we were served every, almost at least three times a week. And it was always served over rice because we were, you know, we did rice because we came from rice culture. And, but I, it was hot is, you know, we didn't have air conditioning in the house. It was, sens- it was not central there. It was an attic fan. It was just hot, humid, you know, in, in North Carolina in the summertime. And I'd eat that second tash till, you know, I couldn't eat another bite. But it, I didn't like a, a little bit of the slime, but I ate it anyway of the okra. And it was just hot and heavy. So I just reinvented that, all of those components, okra, corn, tomatoes, mm-hmm. field peas, onions, bacon. And then I created a, a room temperature salad that 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 has become an iconic thing so that's kind of the way i approach um the creative process i'll take i'll take the best ingredients i can find in the moment that it is and it may be a moment it only may be three weeks or you know like you know like uh, shad row i can only get that three weeks a year or you know strawberries in alabama i can only get those for about six maybe eight weeks and then they're gone well then we move on to something else but there's only the best. And then during that period of time, that's what we focus on. And then we, I just pull things from either my childhood or my travels or the different kitchens I've worked in throughout my career and, you know, reading and traveling and all those different things. And we just try to be smart about the way we think and the way we cook. I know that was a long answer and I apologize for that. No, that's but good. I hope it I'm star- I hope it answers your question. I'm starving. All right, we're coming. <laughs> I want to ask you about a couple of specific dishes when we come back on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right, so let, let's talk about we, we're, we're talking a little business here in the podcast too, uh, and not just delicious food. Now, if you're like us and you are a small business owner, running that HR can kill you. I mean, you, you're just like HR stuff can shut everything down. Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, and HR manager salaries are not cheap. Average of seventy thousand dollars a year. Now, if you're a small business, I mean, that can, if you're trying it for yourself, it eats up all your time. Then you got to find that kind of money to hire somebody, but not with Bambi. Bambi solves that problem. B A M B E E created specifically for us, the small business owner. And you can have an HR manager for as little as $99 a month, crafting HR policy, maintaining compliance. Uh, you can change HR from your biggest liability now to your biggest strength. You have a dedicated HR manager available to you by phone, email, real-time chat. So go to Bambi.com slash Rick and Bubba. Spell out the word and. Bambi, B-A-M-B-E-E.com slash Rick and Bubba right now to schedule your free HR audit. They'll do that for free. Uh, with no obligation, they'll, they'll let you know. They'll, they'll tell you what they can do. Uh, you can do it month to month. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel anytime you want to. So right now, get your free audit uh, and they'll tell you exactly what they should do with your company. That's Bambi.com slash Rick and Bubba. All right, so Chris Hastings is our guest. Uh, he's an award-winning chef. He comes out of um, – or he doesn't come from there. He comes from the, the Carolinas. But he uh, has been running a restaurant in Birmingham. And if you're ever in our part of the of the world, uh, Hot and Hot Fish Club and, and Oven Bird and just great places to eat. 
So we're talking about how your mind works with these incredible dishes. <laughs> but I, I, I'm so I, I know I'm just sitting here I'm drooling so, I, almost. I, I, Chris, it, it, can you just have a hamburger and enjoy it, or do, are you always thinking, "Hey, yeah. how can I make that better?" All right, Bubba. So here's how it works. Number one, I don't shoot all the quail. <laughs> I wish I, could, uh, but you, you can't do that. But back in the day, you know, I would have been a I would have been a a, a, a market hunter for uh, restaurants. But that was you know a long time ago. But to answer your question about you know, what do I eat, right? Yeah, when I'm yeah. Not, Can you just enjoy not, a hamburger? Know, when I'm at home or when I'm, you know, going out to eat or I'm on vacation, I'm, I'm an omnivore. I love a great hamburger. I love great barbecue. I love, I love joints. I love little tiny places like, perfect example, one of my favorite restaurants in Birmingham is Eagles uh, out near the Finley Avenue Farmer's Market. It is the best soul food restaurant in all of the state of Alabama. Did you say Eagles? I go there and I get... I get neck bones and I'll get <laughs> oxtails and I'll get collard greens and cornbread and it will, you will lose your mind eating at Eagles. They are the finest soul food restaurant on the planet. As far as I'm concerned. And I love finding places like that all over. Now, of course, I also would love to sit down to a 24 course tasting menu at, you know, the French laundry and uh, you know, in Yonville, California with Thomas Keller, but I'm going to do that like once every five years um, and, but I'm going to eat all the time wherever I go. And I'm always looking for wherever I am, that place that's really iconic and cool. And when I cook at home, I cook real simply. I, you know, we'll, we'll bake a chicken or we'll, you know, uh, you know, cook some, you know, I'll, I'll make soup or whatever. I mean, it's, it's simple, but good, delicious. Did, did you do this? Cause I, I want to be sure I heard this right. <laughs> so for, by the way, Bubba, if you don't eat his world famous tomato salad, because uh, I know you like I know, tomatoes, I know. he stacks that thing and he puts bacon in every level, and then he puts black eyed peas on it. Just, but anyway, so it's 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 a, it's a game changer. But you did a dessert for a period of time that was like you said the strawberries only come around. Uh, you know, you only have them for a short period of time. You did like a strawberry shortcake with a, with a biscuit. But you now this is what I heard. I want to be sure I heard it right. That the delicious kind of honey drizzle syrupy stuff on it was from honeysuckles and, and it was was that accurate uh, and and, yep. and how many honeysuckles do you have to bring in <laughs> what if I, you I have mean, a mob that night that won't i mean all it has is just a little bitty <laughs> drop how many honeysuckles did y'all lot. go find to come up with that i can tell you my staff hates me in the month of may <laughs> <laughs> because that's in, that's when the honeysuckles are happening that's when the when the when the strawberries start to show up so what we do is we go out in force every morning, like eight or 10 of us, and we find every honeysuckle bush we can find. It's got the golden, golden, golden honeysuckles, right? right. We pack them in big mason jars, the, 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 uh, the two quart mason jars, the big ones, right? And um, actually it might be half gallon, which is, yeah, that's half gallon. And so, um, and then we'll fill them with honeysuckles. And then what we'll do is we'll take simple syrup, which is essentially water and sugar, and we'll boil it and we'll let it cool to where it won't, you know, we'll pour it over the honeysuckles. And so what we're doing is actually we're extracting that honeysuckle flavor and infusing okay. the, 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 the sugar water so it tastes exactly like the nectar. So we multiply the nectar and it's like, so when I, when I have people taste it and then I say, okay, I, I want you to try this. This is, mm. this is something that I think is going to freak you out. And, and they say, well, what is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Right. I want you to taste it. And so I'll give them a little spoonful of it. And it's a honeysuckle nectar that we do. And, uh, and they'll put it in their mouth That's and they'll right. go, oh, my God, that is honeysuckle. I just got transformed <laughs> yeah. to this little yeah. honeysuckle bush in my backyard yeah. when I was a fourth grade. And all my, my boys and I were hanging around eating honeysuckles and just loving life because that's the, the genius and the magic of food is you can put food in your mouth and it can carry you like a time machine to a place when you were in fourth grade with your boys on a honeysuckle yeah. bush. And that's just the way food is through taste and smell. And yes, it's a true story. And we, we take those honeysuckles and we pour, we make the syrup with the, with the uh, strawberries. And then we make, you know, strawberry shortcake with uh, honeysuckle syrup and it will freak you out. Oh It'll yes, blow your mind. it does. You, you already seen me searching for it when it went out of season. I came back. I said, no, where, where's that? And they said, well, look, that's, you don't have it. You got to eat that when we got it. And, uh, but that's the fun because then it, it also, 
you try new things because a lot of us will lock in. If we like something, we'll eat it all the time. So doing it seasonal. Well, Chris, we're out of time. My goodness. Chris, I, we, we, we got to have you back we because do that again. We, we haven't near covered what all we want to talk yeah. about. Can we get you back hey, again look, sometime? You, you guys invite me back anytime. I'd love to come on. I don't care if I – I'll do a, a, a turkey hunting podcast with y'all. Uh, I'll, we can we can talk about, you know, going down and, you know, gigging flounder and Apalachicola. Yes. We can talk about – all kinds of stuff. We, we can, we can, you, you call me anytime. And Chris, we need suggestions how people like Rick and I, who can't really cook, could get a little bit better. Yeah. Now, not to the chef level, yeah. but just so we're not pitiful. Yeah, we've got a foundation, <laughs> but we need you to take us to the next place. So, okay, so right, so, right now we're better, yeah. we're better eating than we are cooking. Yeah, we consume better than we make it. Step one, get the cookbook. Oh, that's right. That's right. That, we've got that at the house. Sherry actually does that. We cook stuff out of the cookbook all the time. So, uh, yeah. so right now, if they're, if somebody somewhere else are listening to this, do you, what's a, what's a website they can go to where they could see, here's the restaurants, here's the book, anything that they, that they could find out. Sure. That would be www.hot, A-N-D, hot fish club.com. It's like Rick and Bubba A-N-D. <laughs> you got to spell out the A-N-D. Yeah. It's not in or ampersand. So it's, you know, hot, not fish club.com. And that'll lead you on to oven bird as well as, you know, our, you know, all the different things that we've done, whether it's, you know, uh, Iron Chef America or, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, you can get that? access to those, you know, that stuff and the Hell's Kitchen stuff and all the work we've done on television. And, you know, we also do cooking classes, uh, you know, Zoom cooking classes and stuff like that. That's so, what we need right there. We, we got to start with one boiling water and work right. our way up. So. Chris Hastings, thank Chris, you so thank much. you. Thank you. And we're hungry. Great, y'all are the best. Love y'all. Love you too, man. And if you're coming to our part of the world uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, you be sure that you get these restaurants on your list, and you will just thank us later, I promise you. And thanks to all of you for being with us uh, on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast.